Well, hello, uh, this is Ms. Stegen Ford, and we are going to be looking today at how the hemoglobin is different depending on conditions in the body, depending on what animal we're looking at, and depending on the time of life. Um, this is a fascinating view of, of the age of the animal, the type of animal, the type of conditions the animal lives in, and also genetics. So it's a great tie into everything that we've looked at. Uh, well, the first one is an example of what happens during um, the development of well, us, mammals. And so we're looking at the developmental changes. So that's what we're looking at right now. So in the blue line, this would be your typical oxygen uh, hemoglobin dissociation curve, which we've seen previous. Uh, but notice the pink. The pink is the fetal uh, he, uh, oxygen hemoglobin dissociation. And there's something to notice about this. It stays uh, level longer. And you notice that it, it goes and it goes and it goes for a longer time and then suddenly it uh, shifts very steeply down. Now there's a very important reason for that and that's because uh, you want the oxygen, notice it says it right here, you want the oxygen to go from the mom to the baby's blood. And again, we still have our saturation over on the y-axis. So this is still referring to the affinity here. So notice we've got, uh, let's just label these. We have point A and we've got point B. Uh, and notice we're looking at something around, oh, 25%, give or take, oxygen. Uh, now think about where that is happening. That is happening at the placenta uh, and that is where the mom's blood and the baby's blood is coming. Uh, they're not mixing, but they're coming uh, very close together, the capillaries. And we can draw that in just a second. We can model that. But what's important to note is at this point of the graph, if you look, mom only has an affinity of about 0 0.035, 0 0.3, uh, but baby's blood, the fetal blood, has an affinity closer to 0.55. So at point A, which is mom, whoops, point A, which is mom, she has a low affinity. And again, you want to think about what this means. This means mom is, mom's hemoglobin is willing to give oxygen up. It unloads the oxygen very uh, willingly. And uh, we'll talk about a molecule that kind of influences in just a second. And then at point B, which is the baby, the fetal hemoglobin, uh, that has a higher affinity, oops, higher affinity uh, for our oxygen. And that means that the hemoglobin is going to bind to oxygen uh, very, uh, uh, very nicely. And that means overall that this is going to go from mom to baby very uh, nicely. And again, this is happening at the placenta. So you would have uh, mom's blood in the placenta. Here's our little capillaries. And so you'd have mom's blood coming and, you know, the baby's veins with the hemoglobin. Uh, and what we want is the oxygen for mom. Let me label those for you real quickly. This would be mom. Uh, here we'd have baby. And so what we are looking at is oxygen going from mom to the uh, baby's uh, capillaries diffusing very nicely and the hemoglobin grabbing onto it. Now, the um, part of the reason for this is the fetal hemoglobin is actually a different protein. I'll show you that in just a second. And the fetal hemoglobin has a... Um, difference in its ability to bind to a molecule we talked about earlier uh, briefly, and that was um, the BPG, and sometimes that's also called DPG. Um, the difference is this is um, 
bisphosphoglycerate, and this is diphosphoglycerate. They both mean to. Um, and earlier in, in the previous video, we saw that this attaches to hemoglobin, and it makes it less um, able to bind to oxygen. It causes, um, it causes the hemoglobin to have less affinity for oxygen. Uh, and that makes it nicer to unload oxygen. And that's what we want in our tissues. We want hemoglobin to unload. Now, what's interesting about fetal hemoglobin, let me just sneak this down here a bit. Um, fetal hemoglobin is made of a different protein. It's made of gamma hemoglobin. Uh, so instead of two alpha, uh, I'm sorry, instead of two beta, it has two gamma hemoglobins. Um, and the difference uh, we see genetically is this causes a difference in amino acids. And uh, this is a nice review point because we have a difference in amino acids, uh, only a couple, but that's all it needs because what will happen is this will not bind, um, it'll not bind to that BPG. Uh, now, the, the take-home message from this is this means that uh, it will have a greater affinity to oxygen, which is what we want. So there's a really nice uh, connection uh, to the genetics, uh, to the protein that's made, to the behavior, the molecular behavior of this. The difference in amino acids that changes the charges in the protein, and that uh, influences its ability to bind to BPG. And so uh, because the BPG can't bind, that will allow the hemoglobin to have a greater affinity for oxygen. We can see over on the left here, this is a really interesting uh, timeline for months after birth, post-conception, <clears throat> uh, I'm sorry, po after conception. And so you see this from zero to, here we are, nine months. This is during the development of the baby. That gamma hemoglobin is made, and it's made predominantly. And then real quickly, right after birth, we see that sharply decline, and we're now producing the beta. And the beta is going to replace the gamma, and now we're going to have our adult hemoglobin pretty quickly after um after birth, and that's the changes in development. Now, if we uh, scoot down here, we already talked briefly about the cells and tissues. Um, this would be the hemoglobin, the blue line, this would be the hemoglobin at rest. This would be hemoglobin during exercise that happened because of the change in pH. Um, now we see the introduction of myoglobin, and myoglobin is found in muscle tissue. And it also contains iron, but it only has one globin. It only has one of those protein, and then therefore one heme group. So it's really only going to take one oxygen to be fully saturated. But you'll notice this happens at very low oxygen conditions. So again, if we're going, let me let's draw it out for a second. If we've got our capillaries. Um, that are surrounding our muscle. So here would be our capillary. And of course, our capillary, we're wanting to deliver oxygen. Uh, right next to it would be our muscle tissue. And the muscle tissue might be, uh, um, well, as if it's being used strenuously, that muscle tissue needs that oxygen. So we want um oxygen to flow very nicely. Now, the hemoglobin is going to give up oxygen very nicely because it's already exercising, so the temperature is up and the uh, pH has gone down slightly. Uh, but the other thing we notice is that when oxygen does diffuse into the muscles, the muscle has myoglobin, 
which ends up storing that oxygen very nicely. And so we have our myoglobin, uh, which would be inside this muscle, and it would be grabbing on. Notice it has a high affinity. So where everything else has a low affinity, if we go up a little bit, myoglobin is able to hold that uh, very nicely as a higher affinity for uh, um, oxygen. So we see that in the tissues, and here's our picture. Here's our myoglobin with only one uh, globin instead of the four that hemoglobin has. And then we can look uh, lastly at animal habitat and uh, selection. Um, and again, this points to a very nice ability for this to be um, a, a combined topic. Here we have our bar-headed goose and penguins, uh, which have a, uh, a hemoglobin that has a slightly higher affinity. Remember, anything in these curves where the curves stay higher longer means that it's going to stay, uh, it's going to grab onto oxygen better. So this hemoglobin has a higher affinity. Um, now, why is that? Well, these are uh, birds that uh, either have to fly higher, in the case of the bar-headed goose, and we are going to be watching a video about that in class. Or in the case of penguins, they have to swim long uh, um, uh, times underneath the water, swim uh, for long distances. And both of these animals then will be benefited by a hemoglobin that can grab oxygen just that much better and then hold on to it and then again release it when it gets to the lower uh, oxygen conditions. So that's going to be very helpful for them. Uh, now they also have other adaptations. Uh, they have larger lungs with air sacs as well. They have higher um, numbers of uh, red blood cells. They actually can make more. Uh, they also have a um, increased capillary density. They actually make more blood vessels. And that makes sense. If there's more capillaries, there's more delivery uh, systems for that. And then we can also look at abnormal hemoglobin, where these would be mutations that change. Notice here's our mutation from glutamate to valine that changes the charges that will affect their physical behavior. In um, sickle cell, when we have low oxygen conditions, this will cause them to clump together, and that causes problems in our bloodstream that, that will cause the red blood cells to change shape, and that's why it's called sickle cell anemia. And then that will influence um, how the body uh, works as well. You can imagine, let's just swing back up here just for a second. If you have, um, why this is related to selection, if you have a population of goose, um, of geese that have that uh, slightly mutated hemoglobin, um, if that gives them an advantage, then you can imagine that they're going to survive better. They're going to have a slightly higher advantage to, to other bar-headed geese. Uh, all right. Well, thank you so much. That concludes um, that lecture for today.